Hey everyone! Today we return to the superhero, and we move from the ecstatic golden age to the weird and wonderful silver age. So, what causes the transition from golden to silver age? The catalyst for the transition from gold to silver age is the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency. It was first established in 1953, but the hearings related to comic books were held from April to June 1954. As a result of these hearings, the Comics Magazine Association of America, which had formed in September 1954, established a comics code, a self-censoring editorial policy whose main aim was to improve uh, parental ideas about what was included in comic books. We'll be talking in a lot more detail about Wortham and the comics code in a few sessions. So let's jump into the Silver Age. So besides the political event of the Comics Code Authority, the textual events that define the switch from Golden to Silver Age happened mostly in DC Comics. So in October of 1956, Showcase number 4 debuts a new Flash, which represents a new vision for DC comic book superheroes. Now this Flash, which you see on your screen, might look a little bit more like the Flash that you recognize today. In the past he had a sort of tin helmet on and looked a little bit more like the FTD flower guy. That was his Golden Age costume. They reworked his costume to look more modern and created a new character and a new backstory. Following the success of this new version of the character, several other Golden Age heroes, particularly Green Lantern, the Atom, and Hawkman, were also revamped in the DC line. These popular heroes were brought together in March of 1960. Now in the Golden Age, there had been superhero groups, particularly the Justice Society of America. But the Justice League of America debuted in the Brave and Bold number 28 and featured all of those Golden Age favorites and some of the new reworked Silver Age heroes working together as a team. This team book created a sense of continuity between the Golden Age characters like Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and Martian Manhunter and the new exciting characters that had been updated for the modern era like Flash and Green Lantern. It also created a new sort of ethos for superheroes and moved them into a new sense of fantasy. No longer were they fighting in the war, but they were fighting cosmic forces, aliens. The book and the new characters were a huge success. If you've been waiting for Marvel, now's the time. So the only Golden Age character we talked about that you might have recognized from the Marvel line was Captain America. And Captain America was actually printed under Timely Comics. Well, Timely Comics became Atlas Comics, and in June of 1959, Atlas Comics changed its name to Marvel Comics. The first two comics printed under Marvel were Journey into Mystery, number 69, I was captured by Corilla, and Patsy Walker, number 95. Patsy Walker, as you might see, we'll talk about romance comics in a few days, is more of a romance and humor comic. Journey into Mystery is a fantasy mystery comic. These aren't the superheroes you're looking for. But, following the popularity of the DC superhero book, especially their team, the publishers of Marvel Comics talked to one of their editors, a little guy named Stan Lee, and asked him to develop a team superhero book. And with that, we have the Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four number one debuted in November of 1961. It was written by Stan Lee and drawn by Jack Kirby. After the huge popularity of Fantastic Four, Marvel decides to try for another superhero title. And about nine months later, Stan Lee works with another artist, Steve Ditko, to create Spider-Man. Appears in Amazing Fantasy number one in August of 1962. Now over the next four years, pretty much all of the Marvel superheroes you know and love get created. Hulk in May of 1962, Thor in August of 1962, Ant-Man in September of 1962, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, Avengers, X-Men, Captain America gets reborn in his Silver Age form, Daredevil, Black Panther. All of the guys that you know and love and who are in all of the movies these days are created in this new explosion of superhero creativity that is the Marvel Silver Age. Now one of the things that defines Marvel is what's called the Marvel Method. It was a form of storytelling via teamwork picture there is Stan Lee in the front and Jack Kirby in the back. So the Marvel method worked like this. Stan Lee and the artist would sit together and come up with a story idea. Then the artist would draw the issue. There would be no set script. 
When the artist was finished with the drawings for the issue, he would send it over to Stan Lee, who would fill in the captions and dialogues to guide the story. This was sort of officially established in March of 1963. The principal figures for the Marvel Method were Stan Lee, who did most of the writing, Jack Kirby, and Steve Ditko. Kirby, in particular, is responsible for most of those heroes that you hear. Ditko is responsible for Doctor Strange and Spider-Man. Kirby did most of the rest of them. So to wrap up, what defines the Silver Age? Well, the early Silver Age, when it comes to DC Comics, is defined by streamlining and reimagining of old characters for more modern sensibilities. It embraces broader scale adventures with a lot more fantasy elements. You'll see a lot of this in the Superman Silver Age stories that you'll be reading. We move from the Superman of the Golden Age, who is fighting corrupt crime bosses, to a Superman who is out fighting space aliens and going on adventures with his super dog. This is also the rise of team books, and because these publishers have been around for a much longer time, we have higher quality and more polished art. The later Silver Age, defined by Marvel Comics, is known for its relatable heroes and anti-heroes. These guys have big powers, but also real problems. A lot of their powers are also blessings and curses at the same time. So even though Spider-Man or The Thing now have these amazing powers, they're also causing them trouble in their family lives or make them outcasts. Because of the small stable of artists, uh, Marvel had a house style and a very clear shared universe. Now, while all of the characters in DC also interacted in the shared universe, in Marvel, it seemed much more clear and a much smaller scale since these characters hadn't really been around since the 1930s. So there was much more of a sense of a community and a shared visual sense, in part because Jack Kirby drew about 80% of the books. The Silver Age seems pretty short in comparison to the Golden Age. The ending boundary is a little bit harder to define, but is generally sort of marked by the moment in which superheroes lose their innocence, and is generally considered to happen in the early 1970s. So there's a story of DC called Snowbirds Don't Fly, in which the Green Arrow discovers that his ward is a junkie. Uh, this shows that the DC heroes are now facing real-world problems in a way that previously DC heroes had been a little bit separated from. On the other hand, in Marvel, uh, we have the death of Gwen Stacy in 1973, something that really brings a lot of seriousness back to the superhero stories. Uh, and she doesn't come back for a very, very long time. She eventually does. Um, but it changes the nature of both Peter's mission and his character. This leads into what we call the Bronze Age, uh, an era in which the sort of gritty superhero is born. If the transition into the Bronze Age is fuzzy, after the Bronze Age it gets even fuzzier. If you're interested in superheroes, though, there's actually a whole class that gets offered through the English department as part of the Comic Studies program. Check it out. It's a great class. Next time, we're going to talk about romance comics. Get ready to feel some feelings.